Hello and welcome to the Hudson Valley One podcast. I'm your host, Zach Shaw, but the star here is Mr. Getty Svekowskis, publisher of Hudson Valley One and the ruler of Ulster Publishing. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I'm ready to rule. <laughs> Excellent. So we've got our first episode of our podcast here, Humble Beginnings. We're here on Wall Street in the Ulster Publishing offices, and we're just going to talk about what's in the paper this week and uh, try and get a discussion going between us and hopefully between you folks who are watching this out there. So it's election season, right? Indeed it is. Why should I care? There's so many things to care about. There's so many entertainments to partake in. Why should I care about the local elections? Well, we think of, of government as distant all the time. But I think what's going on now is um, the, the, this is the year for local elections. Uh, so uh, it's, it's really people you know. It's not quite as distant and as impersonal as it is at a, at a higher level. You know, you see uh, Schumer arguing with McConnell on the television all the time. And, and hordes of reporters around them. And uh, that's not what's happening on November the 2nd. Basically, probably you know a couple of the candidates at least um, in, uh, in any town, and you don't think of them as that kind of impersonal, uh, they're coming to take your rights away from you kind of uh, feeling. That's, that's well, what are they actually coming to do, though? I mean, there's a lot of people out there who don't even understand what a county legislator is, what the town council even does. Okay, well, the, the, the lowest level is the vi village and town. And let's separate that from the city and, and county because they're a little bigger, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in villages and towns, first of all, sometimes village elections are in... Uh, March rather than November, uh, like in New Paltz, and they're going to change that and try to put it, I, I believe they're trying to put it into November instead so you can vote for your, v have the honor of voting for your village candidates in November rather than March, and they'll have more of a turnout. But this is basically uh, towns. Uh, I noticed driving as I do on the wittenberg Glenford Road the first sign I saw was for, I think, Gavin Bellows, who's the son of Gary Bellows, the um, uh, former supervisor. And uh, Gavin Bellows is running against uh, Mike Schultes, who's the in incumbent town highway superintendent. And he's a strong Democrat, and the Bellows are Republicans, so they have been at each other. And I think Bellows versus Schultes has been going on for at least a decade. So the first sign is the yellow sign saying Gavin, vote for Gavin Bellows. So two days later, you see a, another sign uh, and it says, vote for Mike Schultes. So the season has started like mushrooms after a spring rain. That's right, yes. You know? And all of a sudden, s then you have all the Democrats. Uh, I think Melinda McKnight is running for the Democrats this time. In, on their little posters, and you get a few vote Republican kinds of posters as well, so as well as the Bellows one. So you, you will uh, at least have seen all these names. And the day after the election, by, I think by law, you're required to remove those signs. So they're, they go and gather them f for, the, for use two years from then. Right, right. Yeah. Yes, they do spring up like flowers. No, no, that's yeah. So that's not not exactly uh, the kind of distant, imposing, uh, uh, Im unjust sense that you get from government at a higher level. Uh, uh, in uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he, this French nobleman who came to uh, America in the in the eighteen thirties. Noticed how Americans are don't think of themselves as having classes in terms of being inferior or superior. A guy who's running for office is the same kind of guy you are. Now, that is a wonderful thing, except that when it comes to a point where government might be important and we might 
for instance, say on the on the vaccines and stuff like that, government you made government has a larger role. Then what the heck do you do? Because your personal freedom says no, I don't want anything to do with that. But public health and uh, you know with hundreds of thousand people dying, you'd think that that uh, says well you know this this is one of those times that you have. Uh, and should have uh, uh, governmental action. And I think that in the, uh, the generally speaking, in the Trump era, you had uh, a growth of government, but also a hatred of government. You know, MAGA, it says, make America great again. Well, you mean take, away, take power away from the government. And uh, I think Biden is now talking, has been talking about well, it's a time like the Great Depression, where uh, it's actually a time where you you need to make government stronger. For instance, dealing with social media uh, regulation uh, and uh, all, all kinds of things to get the economy going again, etc. So you have kind of it, it sort of blown up at the impersonal level to a matter of ideology. It's like religion. And it shouldn't be. It's just common sense. Mm -hmm. you well, know? So these are the issues that everyone is paying attention to on mainstream media, uh, you know, in the news outside of the local realm. Right. But how do these issues intersect with the local politics? You know, I find that so much of the local politics is very specific to these areas. It's about a water main over here. It's about a development. It's very over specific here. whether the the government should hire an extra cop uh, or whether. Uh, uh, the, a, a particular road needs paving. Those are actually decisions that are made. Right. I was watching a, a common council meeting yeah. about granting a longtime lawyer in uptown Kingston a uh, handicapped parking spot, still a pay spot, but they were making a special accommodation for him because he had lobbied the uh, town council and he was a longtime you know, citizen. And so they allowed him to have this handicapped spot. And I thought to myself, how many uh, Kingstonites would want to understand what's going on here when uh, parking in Uptown is such an issue? So, like, how do we get these uh, citizens more d informed as to what's going on in these meetings and why they should even pay well, attention? Well, first of all, he doesn't own that that handicapped parking spot no. on the street. Yeah. First come, first serve. Right. Yeah. And if somebody is an ex-employee who doesn't really like him, they could get there just <laughs> before he does every morning. And then he'll have to come to the con town council again. <laughs> <laughs> the wheels of democracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, those are those are the kinds of issues. And I I live uh, just over the bo Woodstock border in Shandaken, and you can't imagine two worlds more different than Woodstock and Shandaken. Woodstock is the wealthiest town. Shandaken is close to the poorest. Uh, Woodstock has 7,000 people, uh, many of whom are uh, second homers, and everyone lives uh, kind of off the road. You have some trees in the way. Woodstock is unique that way. Woodstock, they, they, you want to preserve, have as many, preserve the illusion that, no, that the streets are green, that, that it's environmentally pure. Where in Chandaken, um, basically, uh, if you've been around for a while, there's nothing you can't do. Uh, sure. Two different attitudes toward government. I see. And how do you reconcile that? I mean, in this area for a long time, we know that Democrats uh, kind of have good control over certain political areas, but also there are some very Republican areas, probably much like anywhere else in the country. Right. Um, how, do you, how do you, if you're a member of sort of the minority, how do you even say I'm going to participate in these local elections when we get beaten down every year? Well, uh, right now in the county, as you as you know, the Democrats are close to having twice as many uh, party members as the Republicans have. When I came here uh, fifty odd years ago, it was the opposite. There was a Republican town supervisor in Woodstock, which is now five to one Democratic. And uh, our colleague Brian Hollander was a, super, was a supervisor at one time. 
as a, as a Democrat, and the Democrats had Josh Kopovitz was the town chair. Uh, there was this Woodstock Independent Party that we started to get rid of all that nonsense, and it ended up taking over the Democrats. It became the Woodstock Independent Party became the Democratic Party, and uh, you know, so, so you you can't escape the label and be kind of your own thing completely because you get sucked up eventually in the in the whole organization. So that for instance, as in by New York law, the elections commissioners, there have to be two elections commissioner from the major parties, one Democrat, one Republican. And so everybody looks for to get that position because it's a nice little plum. I remember Pete Savego, God bless him and rest his soul, uh, 40 years ago, um, I, I was driving into town, into Kingston about 10.30, and there I saw his car, his, con his red Continental PJS1 coming to town. He's the elections commissioner. He's getting paid, you know, as much as any other uh, uh, party head, and he had that position. And uh, then at 3.30 when I was going home, I saw that car again. So I came to the legislature, the county legislature, and I spoke about that. That's a remarkable coincidence that, that he, it, he spent four hours on his job and drove back, I saw him dro driving back and forth. And it, it was very quiet there because they were all uh, beholden, all mostly Republican beholden to Pete Savego. So, but they really secretly liked that I said that. <laughs> Sometimes this feels like a Game of Thrones, very dramatic scenario of blood feuds between candidates. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, I think it's it's better seen as a soap opera than as uh, a, a, a a way of allocating resources. I, I was talking to a candidate recently who was telling me that he was going for the coveted fake wrestling block in his district. Uh -huh. Apparently there's a large group of uh, people who are into, you know, that dr drama wrestling, the, the fake wrestling. And there's a coach at the top that mobilizes all of those people to vote for a particular candidate. So is this what we're talking about? There are these voting blocks, these cliques of voters that are being courted, whereas the biggest block that isn't being courted are those who aren't voting, aren't participating in the democracy. Right. And that seems to me to be a big problem. Uh, yeah, it it certainly is, and I think, you know, America has always had a lower turnout than any other industrialized country in terms of voting, um, and in an off year, it's pathetic. You know, say, so you you know in some towns that if you if you can get your five hundred people to turn out, uh, you're going to win the election. Right, uh, and that's kind of strange. And the other, you know, they both sides think that. And they, you know, so it's really a, a, a gathering of the faithful f flock mm -hmm. rather than a, um, a, 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 a democratic thing where everyone participates. Right. Like here in Kingston, we had um, in the primaries Phil Ermer, Erner. Uh, he right. defeated David Donaldson in the primaries to take the Democratic line, and Donaldson's running on the uh, working s families or something yep. like that. Yep. Uh, and that was a, an upset by some people's standards, or it was unexpected to a degree. And it seems like they did a really good job at mobilizing new blocks of uh, active people who are active in the community to to pull that off. Right. And, but I think the vote was something that they got 100 or 200 votes, something. So it's not a huge number. Exactly. So, uh, you know, as uh, Lenin uh, displayed in... Uh, in the Soviet, in Russia, it doesn't take that many people. It just takes a lot of commitment and a lot of organization. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I mean, how how do you get these people who aren't uh, voting involved? Well, uh, my theory is that I find it fun because it's spontaneous, it's unpredictable. Even though most of it is dull, there are some interesting moments. And if you don't like the politics of it, you know, with, should this this particular sewer be fixed or not. Uh, look at it as a personality th th thing. What's the relationship? Who's the dominant person? Who are the other people? If you look at it that way, you see 
you know, the same things playing out again and again. It's like a string quartet or a, you know, a, 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 j a jazz group, jazz quartet of that size or something like that, that five members of the town board. It's just, it's just very interesting to see how it works. You know, it's, there's a pecking order sometimes. There's a, hatreds and likes and allies. And uh, that's probably tells you more about politics than, than you know, what they did, which is what's reported. And you have this volume of experience. I've done this for decades. Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've gone to more <laughs> than my share of meetings. It's <laughs> true. I mean, so you must have a really good idea of to what extent these politicians can affect change and, you know, who's sort of behind the scenes as you said in this drama um, you know that is unfolding that must be really hard to report on well one thing you'll notice is that party things are not important as important in a lo very local the, the very local level the town level right uh, you can and to some extent the county level there's there's there are more it's more all the Democrats are one way all the Republicans are the other it's less that way there are people who they talk to each other before the vote sometimes, and they kind of you know go back and forth, and somebody will break ranks, and it's no, it's not a problem. So there's the sense that that we are uh, citizens of of the place, and we want all want it to be better, and uh, we we will recognize on the individual level uh, that it isn't all uh, black and white. But when it comes to the election, it is. Right. And we only have so many candidates in a, in a local election, and it takes a special sort of person to become a politician. I've met so many of them over the years, and they're really unique people. Yeah. You see, you know, uh, uh, that the, the, the town supervisor is, is, runs the departments and everything, right? Now, in many towns, the town board members, the councilmen, have particular things that they're strong at. You know, somebody's expertise is, say, parks and history. Somebody else's uh, public works and and uh, benefits, etc. You know, so they uh, pass all it out. And then some other play, other towns, the uh, the supervisor is dominant, and uh, they all uh, kind of follow that so it's it's really rep a report to the councilman rather than a participatory uh, five people governing you know there's no, there's no particular rule I, I I'm fascinated by this stuff but I think a lot of people are starting to glaze over at this point why is politics so inaccessible why is it so complex why are there you know different power structures and different weights of power in different areas well as I say you know there's 1500 local governments in, in New York, right? Okay. So you get the state, the state. Then you divide it up into counties. There's 63 counties, right? Uh, so then the counties are divided into cities, towns, and villages. One, of, You have to be one of the three. And there's a village law, and there's a city charter law, uh, and, there's a, and, and, and there's town law. Uh, which allows some flexibility, but not much. You follow the town law. The, the town law, uh, you can't do law that is not at your level, right? So then you get, so you get, say, Woodstock is, Shandaken probably has a budget of around two, three million dollars. Uh, Woodstock is around nine or ten, even though it's the population div is not s such right. a great distinction. And the county budget is $350 million. So that gives you some idea. So when, when somebody says something at the Woodstock Town Board, Bill McKenna, the supervisor, answers, and that's that. Um, the uh, county exec, Pat Ryan, has underlings who are specialized in different things. And they attend meetings and just, you know, sort of to see what's what's going on and make it maybe to 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 try to push the, them in one direction or another but there are there are people who do that they're staffers and they they're well paid um, so y you know you get from volunteer government uh, where people do things because they think they should be done 
to uh, highly paid bureaucrats very quickly. Right. And 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 the county is nothing compared to the state, and the state is nothing compared to the federal government. Well, that really puts things in perspective when you look at the dollar figure amounts. Yeah. They right. call that the, the devolution of powers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something about power that draws people who want to continue to ascend the ranks of power, right? Right. So, so yeah. yeah, you get, you know, you get, it's interesting sometimes what happens at the governor level. You've got this, this crazy guy in uh, Texas who uh, is against uh, vaccination unless somebody really wants to get vaccinated and and he um, passed a state law very quickly that uh, private employers in his state could not require vaccination now that means all the airlines all the anything interstate you know, has to do what he says. But th that's a violation of federal law. So that has to be decided by the courts, goes up the courts, f takes a few years, gets to the Supreme Court, and they come to some silly compromise. So not to get on a tangent, but do you really feel there's no room for uh, a vaccine uh, being a personal choice and not being not mandated, and this public health crisis is so severe that the government has to step in and use such a sort of draconian tool. I mean, forcing people to take vaccines or else they get fired from their job, that seems to be a very extreme measure that should be applied to an extreme um, okay, situation. Okay, well, right? look at it this way. I think that um, in some ways, the society and people are more regulated than they ever were. There are more rules than more going on. On the other hand, there are areas of freedom that we have now that we didn't have, say, a century ago. So they couldn't imagine when they were working, when most, most people work in urban areas, worked in factories, and those factories had assembly lines, and everybody had to be there, and everybody got out of the, uh, at the same time, et cetera. And now you ha you're talking about hybrid systems of people working at, being at, their job at a physical place, but mostly being uh, independent and hybrid models, a combination of them. And, every, and a, a fair number, maybe half the, number, half the total number of people will have that flexibility in one form or another. You know, that's, that's an increase in freedom by, by, you know, a long shot. You know, you have more, more choice. It's just uh, unimaginable. Uh, so you get both things going on. You get more regulations and you get more freedom. And, uh, you know, take environmental things. You could do what you damn well pleased for, sure. for eons. And now you notice that, the, hey, what you do affects other people. You uh, mess up a river, you, mess up, you interfere with a whole bunch of other people's systems and other people's rights, and you can't do that. That's a great that point. This was always true, but now we realize we're more aware than ever. That's before. right. Yeah. Yep. So yep. even if you were to have the flu, which is uh, innocuous compared to COVID, it still killed a very large amount of people. And you know, one might say, where do we draw the line? Is that we should we mandate the flu vaccine because it kills forty thousand people a year? I don't, you know, I don't know the exact number. Um, where do you draw that line? What is severe enough of a crisis where you take away per people's personal rights and freedoms to make the decision as to what gets put into their body? Well, the number is probably in a couple of years is about a quarter of a million a year. So it's a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and the irony to me is that people are used to getting measles shots, uh, uh, different other kind of flu shots, even, um, and uh, some of those shots for kids are mandatory. You have to have your shot, right? Or you can't do various things. So that's, uh, th that's the law that's being applied in this situation and restricting that complete freedom that people have. Why should a new um, immunization necessity be different from an old one? Well, it, it is in many ways. It's made from a different technology, uh, you know, developed from gene editing, uh, mRNA 
vaccines. So it's, it's not a brand new technology. It's been studied for a while. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that this uh, is a lab engineered virus that has, you know, escaped from the Wuhan coronavirus lab, yeah. right? So uh, I don't know. I just think that there's room to have a discussion. And but this oh, seems like there is absolutely a room to have discussion. Right. I mean, one of the really interesting things is the religious exemption. Sure. You know, an another is just I, I just don't want to. Another is pregnant women. You know, exactly. where the risk might be greater or something like yeah. that. So it's yeah, I I I, did, I never draw an absolute line. I want to hear what different people say and where they're coming from. Sure. And I think that's 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 the job. Uh, and yet, you know, I might I might have personal views as you do, mm -hmm. and they might be a little even different than yours. Sure. Uh, well, we, we, we got to do talk. another podcast on COVID for sure. But to, <laughs> to bring it back to uh, the local elections, I mean, the local uh, you know people that we elect will have an impact on things like how COVID is handled and they, you know, some things come down from the top, right? As you said, right. the money flows down from the top. Well, what's surprising, I think, is that I think in about maybe close to half the towns, uh, the town supervisor's job, which is up for election, no unopposed, right? you know, in, in Saugerties, which is, you know, bl fought bloody partisan wars for for decades. Now, why, why Fred would Costello anyone is unopposed. run unopposed? It seems like it would just be fun as Because nobody else wants to do it, <laughs> by part. Right, right. And partly because they know they won't beat him. Right. Now, another thing that comes in, in I, I, that doesn't affect local elections as much as higher up, is money. Right. Right? So, uh, lobbyists in Washington are incredibly numerous. Most of the people who are legislators become lobbyists right. after they they've done their time, and they lobby for certain causes and get changes in legislation and stuff like that, and and the whole system is pretty rotten. Yeah, I uh, favor uh, public support for elections and and forbidding private contributions. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, to wrap it all up, you, you're talking about money and the. the the impact that it has on, on everything, really. Uh, isn't the main reason why people don't vote because they have their own lives to worry about, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they're worried about just surviving, and they don't have the time to become informed or be even interested in what people are going to do with the local water main or you know so on? Well, uh, people, Donald Trump in 2020 got as many votes as he did in 2016. The reason he won in 2016 and lost in 2020 is that more people turned out who didn't like him. So, you know, a huge turnout by American standards, something like, you know, 160 million people voted. It was an incredible. Uh, and uh, that's, so that's kind of, that's very impressive on one hand. On the other hand, in Scandinavia, where 85, 90 percent of the people vote, it would be a pretty pathetic show. Right. Well, let's hope that we can get a little closer to Scandinavia. And one way to do it is to subscribe to <laughs> Hudson Valley One and to become informed on local politics, which are covered uh, at this time of year pretty much every week. Right? Yeah. I mean, I, I am more interested in, in individual people, and I'm more interested in, in issues, but I think that um, the coverage of public affairs and you know meetings basically is important, uh, and uh, that you you kind of it's it gives you, you puts your finger on the pulse of what things how things are really made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's more fun than you think, people. Like it, the politics. Yeah, it's is more real. fun than you think. <laughs> 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 That's right. really putting a positive. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it ain't that bad. It's good for you, that medicine. Yeah, yeah, take yeah. it a little bit. Just try it, you know? It doesn't taste that bad. Um, thanks, Getty. And, You're uh, welcome, Get th Zach. Th thanks for listening and watching, and uh, we'll see you next time on the Hudson Valley One Podcast.